Tonight, a huge winter storm buries the Maritimes. High winds, blinding snow, the most in 20 years. We need your help, and we need it now. And it's not over yet. Deadly wildfires rage in Chile, tearing through neighborhoods, trapping some in their homes. Seven people a day die from toxic drugs in BC. We have to do something different. But is there political will? A candid interview with BC's outgoing chief coroner in the breakdown. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansen. A powerful winter storm is slamming parts of Atlantic Canada tonight, dumping huge amounts of snow on Nova Scotia and PEI with no signs of letting up. This is the third straight day of windy, blizzard-like conditions, leading to a long list of disruptions and delays. By the time it's over, parts of Nova Scotia could see up to 150 centimetres of snow. Even for provinces used to fierce winters, this is more snow than usual in many places, and it's making conditions dangerous. Shana Locke shows us how people are weathering this marathon storm. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do this. Okay. Where's the shovel? This is what many Nova Scotians woke up to again this weekend. Mountains of snow, the most in two decades. High winds bringing whiteout conditions, roads treacherous. For some, this was the only way to get around. In the Halifax area, plows are focusing on major roads and bus routes, but many residential roads are still blocked as crews struggle to keep up. I heard there's a car behind there somewhere. There's a car. And as bad as it is on the Nova Scotia mainland, Cape Breton is even worse. Officials there declaring a local state of emergency. They're expecting up to 150 centimetres of snow before the storm is done. My house is completely um, covered with snow on all sides. The windows to my front of the front of my house, usually I have to get up on a ladder to go and clean them. Um, there's snow in those windows right now. That is everywhere. That is across our community. Some drivers who have ventured out are getting stuck in snowbanks and abandoning their cars. Officials are asking everyone to stay off the roads, and the state of emergency gives them the power to enforce it. It also gives the mayor the power to draft extra help. Um, now we can say anybody who has experience who's got machinery, we need your help and we need it now. And on Prince Edward Island, the blowing snow so bad, snow plows were pulled off some roads due to poor visibility, though they will keep trying to clear the main roadways. The last time the region saw this much snow was almost exactly 20 years ago, the infamous White Wan in 2004, a storm still talked about to this day. Shane, it's going to take days to dig out from this storm. What are the implications of that? Well, Transit Cape Breton won't be operating tomorrow. Municipal buildings there and in Halifax will be closed tomorrow. We've seen some elective surgeries have been cancelled. Uh, as well in PEI, a provincial by-election in borden Kincora could be postponed in the morning. But, Ian, uh, we have seen winter storms like this here before. We have uh, seen people out trying to clear their properties, but also some people out having fun, tobogganing, skiing, uh, even some polar dipping. This much snow is a rarity, so some people are just enjoying this moment. Shayna Luck reporting from a blustery Halifax tonight. This storm has already dumped upwards of 60 centimeters of snow in the central and eastern parts of PEI. As Jay Scotland tells us from Charlottetown, there is more in the way. Well, over the last few days, this has been the story on repeat. We've been seeing steady snow and a strong northerly wind that's resulted in significant drifting and whiteout conditions with blowing snow here on Prince Edward Island. As of late this afternoon, preliminary snowfall totals over central and eastern areas have been upwards of 40 to over 60 centimeters, much less over western PEI. New Brunswick has been spared this one. But as we look across the water over to Cape Breton and eastern Nova Scotia, 70 to amounts uh, top 
whopping 100 centimeters have been reported and that strong wind resulting in whiteout conditions and significant drifting. It has really been an issue here in eastern PEI. Plows have had to reduce service or be pulled off the roads from secondary roads in eastern areas. Businesses had to either remain closed or alter their hours to consider staff safety. Clearing has been a nightmare with the drifting. Plow moves through and then the wind carries that snow back across the road. And looking ahead, we could look here on PEI to see another 10 to 20 centimeters with that strong wind gusting 60, 70, even 80 kilometers per hour tonight through Monday, finally easing as we look Monday night into Tuesday. And those additional amounts could be even heavier for parts of eastern Nova Scotia, 10, 20, locally over 30 centimeters of additional snow possible as we look to tonight through Monday. But again, that part of the country also starting to uh, see conditions improve into early Tuesday. We're not through it yet. Still more snow to come and unfortunately a lot on the ground for that wind to move. Jay Scotland, CBC News, Charlottetown. In California, more than half a million people are without power tonight as an atmospheric river batters much of the state. Officials warn heavy rain and hurricane force winds could cause flash flooding and mudslides. Forecasters say more than a month's worth of rain could fall between now and Tuesday. This is the second major storm to slam the state this week. In Chile, a state of emergency has been declared as intense wildfires burn out of control. At least 99 people have died. Thousands have lost their homes. Katie Nicholson shows us the emotional toll. Walls of flames swept forward by high winds have now pushed Chile into a state of emergency. The country's president surveyed the damage from a helicopter and warned of a substantially growing death toll. La cifra oficial en este momento es de 60... Hundreds are still unaccounted for. Monday and Tuesday will be national days of mourning for fire victims. Curfews are also being enacted in some areas to ward off looting. Hola. From Winnipeg, German Alberto calls to check in on friends and family in Chile. They're trying to be calm and as much as possible. He says it's hard to be so far away and not be able to help. His daughter is there too, near one of the hardest hit areas. Very um, um, scary situation. These fires come after a week of record high temperatures on top of months of dry, hot weather across South America, courtesy of El Nino. The infernos in Chile invoked prayers a world away at the Vatican. We pray for the dead and injured, the Pope said. Near Viña del Mar, where some of the largest fires pushed in from the forested areas to residential ones, hundreds have lost everything and now root through the charred remains of their homes. It's almost too hard to contemplate. <laughs> this was my workshop, he says, all the sacrifice, all in a lifetime. All reduced to ash, an unfolding heat-fueled nightmare with no end in sight. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. The U.S. and U.K. have carried out a new round of strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen, with Canada playing a supporting role. This is the third straight day the Allies have hit Iranian-backed groups in the region. British and American fighter jets and U.S. warships struck 36 Houthi targets, including weapons, storage facilities, missile systems, and radar installations in 13 locations. The U.S. Secretary of Defense says it was a continuation of their efforts to stop the Houthi militia from attacking ships in the Red Sea. The Houthis say they're acting in support of Palestinians in Gaza, where fighting between Israel and Hamas has raged for months. Attempts to negotiate the release of hostages continues. But as Chris Brown explains, inside Israel, that is a complicated calculation. For the families of the Israeli hostages held by Hamas, this is a pivotal moment. Their pleas, vigils and protests have helped sway the public mood towards accepting a pause in the war against Hamas in order to get the hostages home. 
Shai Benjamin's 57-year-old father, Ron, has been in captivity for 121 days. It breaks my heart because I never know if my dad will be a part of the deal. We just need that deal. They need to get out. They need to be here as soon as possible because time is running out and we need them at home. But as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's cabinet met Sunday, there were divisions over what Israel should give up to get the more than 100 hostages back. The far-right ministers who keep the government in power want the war to go on. We will not agree to any deal and not at any price, said Netanyahu, trying to keep his options open as international pressure for a deal mounts. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will spend the next several days in the region pushing to get an agreement on a ceasefire and a plan for Gaza after the fighting stops. This Jerusalem-based political scientist says Netanyahu will soon have to pick a side. It's all about uh, maintaining his coalition. The extreme right is, is pressuring him, he's pressured. So he's saying some things in Hebrew to the coalition and in English he sounds more moderate. Uh, at the end of the day, we'll have to decide. Foremost for many outside of Israel is that a pause or truce would let more help into Gaza, where conditions are dire. A videographer working for CBC News took these images after Israel's military vacated part of the north. There doesn't appear to be a livable building left standing. Resident Abu Tamer Harb said, My blood and sweat is just gone. In the blink of an eye, nothing. The world was erased. There were chaotic scenes in Gaza City as people trying to get food and humanitarian relief were sent fleeing by weapons fire that some blamed on an Israeli tank. People are struggling. They can't find anything to eat, said Zakaria Shaniora, who was caught up in the shooting. They put their lives at risk so they can get a bag of flour and a can of meat. Most Palestinians in Gaza have now fled to a tiny area in the south surrounding Rafah next to the Egyptian border. It's where Israel's defense minister has suggested Israel intends to move its war efforts to next. And so, Chris, the next move in this conflict appears to be up to Hamas. Well, Israelis and Palestinians, Ian, have all been hoping for word this weekend, but there are persistent reports that the holdup in a deal is over the length of the pause in the fighting. Benjamin Netanyahu has told Israelis he will not accept full withdrawal from Gaza, but that is what Hamas says it wants. U.S. officials say that while in the region, Antony Blinken will be relentlessly pursuing what they call a sustained pause in the war. Ian. Chris Brown in Jerusalem. And desperate Canadians are waiting tonight to hear when their relatives can get out of Gaza. It's been nearly a month since Ottawa announced a temporary program to allow some extended family members into Canada. As J.P. Tasker shows us, that wait was too long for one family. <laughs> for Maher Alinkar, the grief is overwhelming, watching his nephew in pain in a Gaza hospital. It's really uh, a tragedy that someone uh, close to you is... is uh, you cannot do anything for him and or her. Alan Carr was trying to bring his sister Hannah and her three children to Canada. They were waiting for temporary visas, part of Ottawa's new program to get extended family out of Gaza. But she was killed in an Israeli attack before the Canadian government could deliver the necessary paperwork. You can see it in the news, you can see it in a war movie, but, but, but when your uh, bloodline gets killed, I, don't, I cannot imagine uh, how, how to, to get you that feeling. Hannah's 17-year-old son, Amr, also died. Her two other children just barely made it through. Me and my brother suffered a long night that day to live and to survive. We lived almost 10 hours of, uh, of horror, of pain. A freelancer for CBC News spoke with the oldest survivor, Saina. There's shrapnel in her shoulder. Her brother Adam is writhing in pain with third-degree burns on his broken limbs. Zaina is now his only lifeline in this war zone. The rest of their relatives in Gaza are dead. When we came to the hospital, he was in such a crucial state. Uh, they thought he was dead. Back in Ontario, Alan Carr feels like his family's been abandoned by the federal government. You're trying to help, but... Uh... The process or the whole system is not helping you out. The government says it's doing what it can, but Israeli and Egyptian officials decide who gets out. We'll continue to make sure that the people that were authorized 
by Canada to leave are able to. We've made a commitment to these families. Nearly a month after the visa program launched, more than a thousand Palestinians with the Canadian connection have registered. Not a single one has gotten out. JP Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. The federal government is extending its ban on foreign home buying until 2027. The ban came into effect last year as part of an effort to deal with the high cost of housing, but some experts question its effectiveness. The ban prohibits foreign nationals and businesses from purchasing property in Canada. There are some exceptions, including refugees and temporary workers. Hundreds of people rallied outside Alberta's legislature today, pushing back against planned changes to transgender policies in the province. Julia Wong now with their message for the Premier. A show of force outside the Alberta legislature. Hundreds of people pushing back on the province's plan to change some policies affecting transgender children. They include banning hormone therapies and puberty blockers for kids 15 and under and requiring parental consent or notification before a student can change their name or pronoun. Policy that dictates that the school would have to out children would have put me in danger. This crowd, among them Federal Cabinet Minister Randy Boissonneau, here to send a message to transgender youth. We see you, we love you, and we are here to defend and stand with you! And to Premier Danielle Smith. She's our leader, she represents all of us, and so she represents these queer and trans kids too. And they have the right to their bodies and to medical care. This mother of a trans son says the proposed policies feel like a step backwards. My biggest concern is, this is, it seems that this is a small group of very loud people who are influencing policy. After Saskatchewan and New Brunswick made similar moves, some believe Smith was facing pressure. Certainly there are socially conservative groups that uh, try to exert influence uh, in the political system in Alberta and presumably that is the source and the Premier is uh, concerned about responding to them. But this transgender columnist says some of the policies could help kids. If you're not even giving the parents a chance to be affirming, to support that kid and to come alongside them, then the school is in a sense enacting an intervention. For me, this is balancing the risk of moving forward with irreversible surgeries and hormonal interventions with the benefit of transitioning young. The proposed policies have already prompted sharp words from the federal government in what is already a tense relationship. But there could be opportunity for the two to talk more. Smith will be in Ottawa on Monday. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. A Go Public investigation is getting answers after a scammer gets caught in the act. We're sorry, we're not happy doing this, but we have no option. How the operation works and what you need to do to protect yourself. Plus a four-year fight for a heartfelt reunion. It was really a relief and it really restored our faith in the humanity of the, of the system. The surprise that it's bringing a family back together. And... You guys want to see something really cool? A cold spell in Texas leads to an odd alligator sight. Hey, look at his snout. We're back in two. Now to a go public investigation into romance scammers, fraudsters who create fake profiles online to dupe their victims out of thousands of dollars. As you'll see, when a romance scammer targeted our Erica Johnson, she called him out and he agreed to an interview. The notification flashed on my phone, an Instagram message from a stranger. Nice smile, he wrote. I'm Bobby Brown from Sacramento, California. He claimed to be an oil engineer, working in another country, of course, a classic claim of a romance scammer. To convince me, he sends this photo ID, but, hmm, the signature doesn't match his name, and also shows me his neighborhood, supposedly in Edinburgh, but the cars are on the wrong side of the road. After weeks of professing his love, I call him out. Reluctantly, he gives up the ruse, says he'll talk if CBC conceals his identity, worried about his safety. His real hometown? Not Sacramento, Ogara, Nigeria, where he says he was forced to become a romance scammer after his father lost his job. He says he went to live with a man who trained him and others. Late in the night, you're going to be called 
to the living room, get your social media account ready, start hustling. He says he works on his own now, tells women, often in Canada, that he can't access his bank account since, you know, he's working overseas, needs data for his phone. They send him gift cards like these that he sells for cash. When a woman's clearly in love, he says, he goes for the big payoff, claims his son has been rushed to an American hospital and he urgently needs her to send a $3,000 deposit for care. This social psychologist says, unbelievable as the stories sound, people who think they're in a romantic relationship can feel obligated to help. Even a simple request uh, that might seem outlandish from an observer's point of view might feel different when you are the one being asked to do things. Last year, 945 Canadians lost more than $50 million to romance scammers, about 53000 each, and that's just what victims reported. The scammer tells me he knows it's wrong, but poverty runs deep. We're sorry we're not happy doing this, but we have no option. Well, Eric, an apology there, but that's not much comfort if you've been duped out of money. No, Ian, and as you know, we've done stories about people who've lost their entire life savings, so no one likes to be duped out of their money, no matter the size, especially where the heart is involved. And so what advice do you have for people who want to protect themselves from these scammers? You know, if you're contacted online by someone who claims they live near you but they're working overseas, if they profess their love too quickly and then start pressuring you for money, those are all red flags. The best thing to do if that happens, delete those messages, block the account, and keep your cash. Good advice, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Our Go Public stories come from you if you have a tip. For the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. A BC woman's fight to bring her great niece to Canada could be coming to an end. We can get onto a plane and we can be a family. The surprise twist in her four year legal battle. And a CBC News investigation into sexual assault charges against junior hockey players. Athletes get more of the benefit of a doubt than, than the average person. Why some say players are being shielded from consequence. And BC faces its deadliest year yet for deaths from toxic drugs. We're just seeing the trajectory continue to rise um, and it's, it's terrifying. The response from the outgoing chief coroner. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world. Next. We are Toronto. We are Canada's opening game. A historic honour for Toronto as FIFA announces the schedule for the 2026 Men's World Cup, co-hosted by Canada, the US and Mexico. As you just heard, Toronto will host the first World Cup match on Canadian soil on June 12th, one day after the official World Cup opener in Mexico City. Of the 104 scheduled games, Canada will split 13 between Toronto and Vancouver. A British Columbia woman is celebrating tonight. After a four-year fight, she's finally won the right to bring her great-niece from South Africa to Canada. The girl's mother suddenly died, forcing her to survive on her own for days. She's been in foster care ever since. But as Yvette Bren shows us, she'll soon be with relatives who can't wait to have her. This small travel bag has sat packed for years. One suitcase stuffed with treasures, warm clothes, awaiting a child thousands of kilometres away. All her possessions I have in a suitcase that I brought back with me from South Africa. So then we went to the Kruger Park. Last year, Lisa Pine Mercier first shared her years-long battle to bring her great-niece to British Columbia, a battle that began with a tragedy. Riley Ridland was just seven years old when she was found alongside her dead mother's body on a rural property outside of Pretoria. She survived alone on noodles and peanut butter for more than a week in 40-degree heat. Somehow, she started the generator, fed animals, and ended up treated for malnourishment and malaria. Honestly, I expected that because of the circumstances surrounding this, I would jump on a plane and go and fetch her and bring her home. That's not what happened. Riley was caught in legal limbo for years. She lives in foster care, but wasn't legally considered an orphan because her father remains alive, despite the fact he gave up all parental rights. 
It took years of court applications, letters to Canadian officials, even a formal adoption in South Africa. Finally, late last week, a letter from Canadian Immigration. Permission to apply for permanent residency. I was thrilled. We were thrilled. We worked on this case long and hard. It was really a relief and it really restored our faith in the humanity of the, of the system. The plan is to only tell Riley once her new passport arrives. How much more real would it be when you hand her that passport and you say to her, you see the stamp, this is what this stamp means. And that means we can get onto a plane and we can be a family. Hello, everybody. So far, that feeling, that family embrace, has been limited to short visits to South Africa. But soon, they hope to hug for the first time on Canadian soil. Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. Now it's time to dig deeper into the news shaping our world. BC's chief coroner steps down with a strong message about those mounting drug deaths. First and foremost, we need to address the toxic illicit market. Are politics at play here? But first, five pro hockey players prepare to face charges of sexual assault in connection with an incident from when they played for Canada at the World Juniors. These players uh, are innocent until proven guilty. We crunch some numbers on the conviction rate of players charged with sexual assault. There's, you know, a, a sense of wanting to believe in our celebrities. And we hear from young players now being taught about respect and consent. So I think it's something that needs to be known in dressing rooms. This is The Breakdown. Jonathan Gatehouse starts us off with his look at what happens when hockey players go to court. Nicolas Daig and Massimo Siciliano were champions on the ice with the Victoria Voltigue of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. The glory supplanted by shame when the two men appeared in Quebec court last October, pleading guilty to sexually assaulting a young woman during a 2021 team celebration. An all too common allegation in hockey circles, but criminal convictions are relatively rare when it comes to junior players in Canada, says this law professor. And so it's not surprising to me that that uh, athletes get, first of all, uh, more of the benefit of a doubt than, than the average person might get. I think there's you know, a, a sense of wanting to believe in our celebrities, especially hockey players, you know, uh, live in a very rarefied atmosphere in Canada. Sexual assault is a vastly underreported crime in Canada. And even when allegations are brought to police, many investigations end without charges. CBC News found 47 publicly reported cases where young hockey players were charged with sexual assault dating back to 1989. Seven of those cases ended with a guilty verdict, a conviction rate of just 15% for the small sample. That's far below the average conviction rate of 42% for all sexual assault cases which make it to court, according to Statistics Canada. The numbers may not tell the whole story. An accusation isn't the same as proof, and Canada's justice system presumes innocence. But Gilbert says fame, status, and financial resources may give players an advantage in such court cases. The ability to, to bring in high-profile, uh, experienced, well-staffed law firms makes a huge difference compared to the average person who has to maybe rely on legal aid. For sociologist Alexis Peters, focusing on legal outcomes ignores what she believes is the underlying cause an elite hockey culture still rooted in hyper-masculinity. You need to change the subculture so that the young men feel safe um, in an environment um, and where they're not rewarded for violent behavior from the time they're five. Hockey organizations in Canada have been talking about changing attitudes and educating players for decades. Yet the assault allegations keep surfacing. My name is Bailey Reed, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Spark Strategy, and we provide consulting services for sexual violence prevention. Often organizations, when they're in a situation like this in a very public crisis, uh, will mandate training, and in those situations, people feel like they're getting in trouble, they're being punished they come with an attitude that they're not interested in changing or they're you know they're not part of the problem so instead framing it as they're part of the solution and how can you help us change i think is a much more effective approach jonathan this data doesn't include the the recent charges in london but is there anything else you can take away from the numbers 
Uh, that's true, Ian. We're talking about only completed cases here. And looking back over 35 years, there are perhaps fewer sexual assault charges and guilty verdicts than people might imagine. But there is one data point worth noting here. Sexual assault allegations can take years to work their way through the system, and many cases end up being dropped. In fact, Statistic Canada's figures show that almost half of all such charges end up being withdrawn or stayed. There too, another seeming advantage for Canada's junior hockey stars. Two-thirds of the cases that CBC News examines, 31 of the 47, ended up having their charges dropped. Jonathan Gatehouse in Toronto. Thank you. The overarching goal, of course, is to change the behavior of players so that offenses don't happen and no more cases have to go to court. Quibino Duro shows us how young men and even boys are getting that education. This is a refresher course on consent. No means no, exactly right. That is the main thing. The students are from the Duro Dukes men's hockey team. It was good. It was good to, like, know because I think it's something that needs to be known in dressing rooms. It's a result of a partnership between the league and the Kawartha Sexual Assault Centers. Players talk about respect, leadership, sex, as well as drugs and alcohol. Some players agree a cultural shift is needed in the locker room. Well, there's a lot of like hazing, kind of, I would say, and sometimes it can go a little far. So it's just good to like find that line. Leading Saturday's workshop, former pro rugby player Luke Ben Veltsen. He says many young athletes question the notion of consent because of traditional gender roles and toxic masculinity in sports. These sorts of programs will help prevent these types of ideas. And the, the, the thing that I think helps that prevention the most is that it gives kids an opportunity to intervene with their mates at a level before it gets there. He says it's important that these lessons come from someone the players can relate to, and parents agree. He definitely appreciated it coming from somebody else instead of his parents um, because he was able to connect with the instructor better than what we could connect with him. Since last year, around 150 young people aged 7 to 18 have received the training on a voluntary basis, nearly 95% of the league's players. We're building kids that are going to be our citizens of tomorrow and we want them to be respectful and we want them to only maybe start changing the image of hockey and what that looks like. It's a pretty privileged sport and uh, we want to seek those opportunities to influence change if we're able. But it all depends on the message getting through. That bad behavior of the past is simply not acceptable. I, I don't really talk about it much but I, I think it's horrible and I don't think it should ever happen again and hopefully with guys like Luke coming around and talking at all arenas it won't happen again. Quibino Duro tells us those workshops are also offered to teams in the Ontario Hockey League, part of the OHL's onside program to increase understanding and awareness of sexual harassment and assault. And now players in other sports are getting those lessons. BC's chief corner is sending a message before stepping aside. As long as people are dependent on that illicit drug supply, they will continue to die for push for the expansion of a safer supply. BC's chief coroner leaves her post with an urgent plea about drugs and deaths. Because as long as people are dependent on that illicit drug supply, they will continue to die. She says a larger supply of safer drugs would save lives. There is a lot of pushback uh, right now. She speaks candidly about the politics behind that pushback. Lisa Lapointe became BC's chief coroner in 2011. We sat down for one of her last interviews in that role. The facts are devastating. More than 2,500 people in BC died from toxic drugs last year. That's an average of seven people per day, the worst year on record. It's become the major crisis of Lisa LaPointe's time as chief coroner, a job she leaves in a few days. Our politicians need to be courageous. They need to push back against that narrative that we are providing drugs and I hate to use this word, to drug addicts. That's an ugly word. It's stigmatizing, it's dehumanizing. The political courage she calls for is around the so-called safer supply approach. 
access to drugs that aren't contaminated, in some cases, but not always, prescribed by doctors. LaPointe has seen the lives lost and the impact on families. We also visited families, including these mothers back in 2017. Substance abuse, and for some, the death of their sons brought them together. 22 years ago, I gave birth to Tristan, and today I buried his ashes under this tree. You know, every day people are dying and families are being broken. And this is how birthdays are being celebrated, right? It's like, this is my son's birthday party. This is it. As you watch that tape, what, what goes through your mind? Well, of course, my heart goes out to the family. I'm a mother, and the thought of losing your child in that way, a preventable death, uh, it's heartbreaking. And it's, I also hear echoes of other mothers that I've spoken to, and the heartbreak that I hear in their voices and that I see in their eyes, the frustration that we know this crisis is happening in our province. I also see there's such a, a misperception that this is a downtown east side problem or a Surrey, you know, Wally Strip problem. Mm -hmm. And that is, that mother and that situation is what we see. It is families in suburban neighborhoods, rural communities, uh, people just like us, uh, and not to diminish the impact mm -hmm. on the downtown east side, which is horrific. But the majority of people dying are dying in neighborhoods across the province, uh, families that you know, f for one reason or another, their loved one um, has had some challenges with substance use. 2,511 deaths last year in British Columbia from illicit, unregulated drugs. And so I'm curious about your reaction to that staggering number. Is it sadness? Is it frustration? Is it, is it helplessness? All of the above. You know, for me, it is a staggering number but it is also the people. It is the, the names and the faces behind those numbers and their families. And that's what really hurts the most, that all of those families are suffering and all of those families are grieving. And, you know, we're just seeing the trajectory continue to rise. Um, and it's, it's terrifying. This is a big complex problem. Are there things that could be done that would significantly reduce the number of these deaths, let's say, in 2024? Yeah, so we've held three death review panels into this, and the common um, refrain through all three panels is evidence-based treatment, uh, a continuum of care, recognizing that we have criminalized this problem for so long. We had a massive infrastructure built to respond on a criminal level, courts, police, institutions, but we haven't built the infrastructure to respond on a health level. So that continuum of care for treatment, prevention, all of those things, but in the immediate, right now, separating people from the toxic drug supply. Because as long as people are dependent on that illicit drug supply, they will continue to die. It, it, it's so highly toxic and unpredictable. So this is the so-called safer supply, mm -hmm. right? This is providing drugs or making drugs available to people that has been tested so that it isn't contaminated with things that will kill them. You're about to leave your role as chief coroner. Maybe you're a little freer to speak about this. I think a year ago, I got the sense the provincial government was, was kind of on board uh, getting in the direction that, that you're suggesting in safer supply. They seem to have backed off. Um, are politics at play here? Access to safer supply has been so limited. So of, of 225,000 people at risk, 4,200 currently have access to prescribed safer supply, 2%. So the other 98% of people are at risk. And I think there is, you know, I'm not a politician, uh, and I think that's why it's so important that the coroner service be an independent, impartial, objective service. We look mm -hmm. at the data. We provide recommendations to prevent deaths, but we're, we're, not, we're not political. And there is a lot of pushback uh, right now from people from an ideological perspective think we should go back to the practices of the past that got us here in the first place. So it's trying to push back against that with rational argument, um, data, evidence from evaluation from some of the pilot studies and saying, we know, we understand this is novel. It's going to be a process. We continue to measure, adjust as necessary, like we did with responding to COVID, but, uh, but we have to do something different. So when I look at public reaction to drug policy in British Columbia, there's some compassion. 
but there's also frustration. There are a lot of people, and, and they'll attach their names to this public criticism. We'll say, we're tired of watching people use drugs in public. It makes us feel unsafe. It's unsavory. It's not the kind of, in Vancouver, city we want to have. And here's the chief coroner or people in government who, are, who want to hand drugs to people who use drugs. They want to enable this, and we're tired of it. Yeah, and that's a really great point, Ian. And I think, what, you know, really what I would say is we're all tired of it. Nobody wants to see that. Where we may differ at this stage is in the response to it. So nobody wants to see people who are unhoused, living precariously, um, or living precariously housed on the streets, living on the streets, doing everything that they, their whole life is on the streets, including using drugs if they are drug users. That is not something any city wants to see. So, so how do we respond to that? Do we push them further into the shadows where they are far more at risk of dying and, and kind of wash our hands and say, okay, well now I feel comfortable, I can walk down the street. Or do we respond in a more compassionate way and say, we need to solve this problem. What is a long-term solution that will reduce the vulnerability of, of these people, that will reduce the harms that are happening? Your tenure as chief coroner coincided with the pandemic, a public health crisis, but definitely coincided with this illicit, unregulated drug crisis. And you leave with certainly the drug crisis unresolved. So. Now you have maybe your last chance to kind of get a message to the public. And, and, and what message do you want to give them about the drug crisis? It's so important to recognize that this crisis is a result of the toxic illicit market. So first and foremost, we need to address the toxic illicit market. Unless we're okay with watching 2,500 uh, of our community members die, people who are valuable to us, then we need to be willing to look at this rationally. I hope that people will look at this rationally, look at the evidence and not, and not, be, not be taken in by those who say, oh, if we go back to what we've always done, we'll fix it. We don't, it's a different time. We have to, we have, to have a new lens and, uh, and listen to the data and listen to the health, healthcare professionals. Lisa LaPointe, a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Now, one province over in Alberta, they're taking a much different approach, not focusing on safer supply, but rather treatment. We're going there in the next few days to get that side of the story and, most importantly, to look at the data and see what impact that approach is having. Coming up, a cold-blooded animal frozen in place. That animal is in full hibernation right there. His heart's beating three beats per minute. The backstory behind this bizarre sight is our moment. All right, there is an alligator there, almost completely submerged in a frozen pond, but no need to worry. It's not in any danger, in fact, just the opposite. It turns out that alligator is one of several that entered a form of hibernation after a particularly cold stretch in Texas. And tonight, those unique reptile appearances make our moment. You guys want to see something really cool? Look at this. Look right down here. You can see the entire body of the alligator, but most importantly, look at its snout. It has pushed its snout up, so it, up through so it can get oxygen, it can breathe. That animal is in full hibernation right there. His heart's beating three beats per minute. Folks, that's amazing. That's how alligators survive in the ice. An alligator will go through a part of a hibernation called brumation. In other words, when, when the water temperature starts to get cold, they'll stop feeding for the year. We had almost sub-zero temperatures, which is very, very rare for us here. Down south in Texas, Instead of the, the groundhog, we use alligators to find out if we're going to have six more weeks of winter, which we call Gator Day. If alligators are coming out of the wintertime, they will eat. But if they know it's going to get cold again, they won't eat. Today, we fed Big Al and he did eat, meaning the spring and summer is here. Winter is now over. I was trying to avoid Groundhog Day stories. I didn't on Friday, and little did I know that Gator Day would rear its frozen head today. Uh, Gary points out that, you know, we said this at the beginning, the alligators are completely fine. They're kind of built for this, but they can't stay that way for weeks. Good news is, it's Texas. They won't have to stay that way.
for weeks. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hannah-Mansing in Vancouver. Good night.